is Laura Alford, continuing our series on hydrostatics. Um, no, we've gone through a bunch of stuff with ships, and I wanted to talk about submarines, because the hydrostatics of submarines is actually quite different in some ways um, as ships. But I realized that it, I, submarines operate in conditions that are quite a bit different than ships. Um, it's a lot more complicated. I thought, you know what, let's take a step back and talk about just the environment that the submarines operate on so that everybody's on the same page. Um, so that's, that's what I want to talk about today. Um, the environment for a submarine it really is truly 3D. I mean, ships, you sort of think of it as, as yes, technically it's three dimensions and the ship moves up and down and side to side and all that. Um, but ships mostly just operate on the surface, right? They're going through, sh they're going through waves and, and they're driving around and stuff. A submarine's got to deal with this, right? I mean, it's, they're going up and down and back and forth and side to side, and there's currents going every which way. I mean, and it, it's just sort of a mess, right? I mean, here's, here's a bunch of environmental factors. Right, for submarines, like, this is really complicated. I mean, you've got to deal with all of this stuff. Um, so, you know, all of these different things, there's wind-driven circulation, there's internal waves, and the density is changing. And you've got, if you get down really deep, you've got all the sediment that you've got to deal with. Um, communication is very diff difficult, right, because ship, right, just stick a GPS compass on it, right, and it knows where it is. It doesn't work underwater, you, you know, so you've got to use acoustics and lots of specialized equipment. So this is, this is really complicated. So let's, let's, let's dive into this a little bit here. Um, so first in the atmosphere, you've got wind coming at you, making waves, also just, you know, and if the submarine's at the surface, you've got to deal with wind effects there. Rain, there's heat that's coming in and changing conditions in the ocean, and then there's fog. Right, um, actually, at the air sea interface, um, these are operating conditions. Are, don't, no, they are known as sea states. Um, it's, it's a measure of, of how big the waves are and such. Um, there's there could be ice floating around, solid or or um, in chunks. Um, you can get ice that um, water that sprays up over the submarine that then causes ice to form on it. Um, the the wind creates surface gravity waves. Um, you've got to deal with so all of that affects your dynamic stability, your sea keeping, your maneuvering, all this stuff. So again, that's so this is where ships live for the most part, right? And so you see, this is complicated enough, and this is just one little part of the whole environmental considerations for submarine operations. Um, getting down into the water column. The, you can see that there's, there's different levels of ocean when, you, when you're looking at the depths of it. In the shallow ocean, it's light, it's warm, not too, you know, the pressure's not that great, lots of animals and plants, and it's happy and stuff. Uh, we, deep down into the ocean, um, it's dark. Uh, there, there's no light, it's cold, very high pressure, and there's almost no life. Uh, and then it, it changes all the way through this. I mean, this, these are two, just the shallow ocean to the deep ocean are two completely different operating conditions and, and sets of, sets of, in, of variables you have to consider. So it, you, got your, you got your work cut out for you here. Um, the water column itself is characterized by the temperature, the salinity, and the density of the water. So salinity is the amount of dissolved solids, how much salt is in the water. Um, from these three, you can calculate the hydrostatic pressure, the sound velocity, heat capacity, and electrical conductivity. Uh, we're mostly going to focus on the temperature, salinity, and density, and then from that pressure, because that's what we're concerned with uh, in order for hydrostatics. But overall submarine design, you would need to account for all of this stuff. So first of all, temperature. Um, here is a, an example of some sea, just some surface temperatures of oceans all across the world. Um, you see there's a, a pretty big range, this degree Celsius here. Um, you get from very cold waters at the, at the poles all the way up to very warm waters at the equator. And so again, just showing the variety of the operating conditions here. Um, it not only varies with latitude, it does, it does uh, vary with depth as well, right? So you've got some, so these, these are called profiles. It's a density profile. And you can see that it's generally, it's warmer at the surface and then gets uh, cooler and as you get down deep. Um, so just comparison here. Um, there is, there is a, there's a range where the temperature changes very quickly. That's called the thermocline. So it's a fast change in temperature here. Um, so salinity, again, the amount of dissolved solids that's in the water. Um, here's a, a nice map showing where there are uh, the salinities at the surface here. Um, you can see there's much more sort of in the, the polar regions, or uh, sorry, in the uh, equatorial regions, the tropics. Um, usually a lot more, you know, depending on like, you know, closer to um, civilizations and stuff like that. Shallower seas, the Mediterranean is quite high. Um, things like that. Um, again, salinity also varies with latitude and depth, um, even amongst the oceans, right? It changes here. 
So um, in this case, again, you get a fast change. It's, this one is called the halocline. So just some terminology that you're going to see if you start working with this stuff. So I wanted to, to give an introduction to some of these, these terms. All right. Density is really kind of what we're trying to get to so that we can then calculate pressure. Density is just mass per unit volume, right? Um, it affects the hydrostatic pressure, uh, the sound of velocity, heat capacity, and elect electrical conductivity, all this stuff. Density itself is affected by salinity, temperature, but also pressure. Okay. Um, Here's an example of density. It's a, the profile here. Now, this does not include the effects of pressure. Because I want to show just, just how things change as, uh, as a function of temperature and salinity here. So at the equator, um, the density is lower. This is a lot of rainfall hitting at the equator. Um, also, river runoff. So same thing in the tropics. It's not quite as much as the equator. But you're getting rainfall. You're getting rivers discharged. So that's why at the surface there is a lot more fresh water. And then, or I'm not, not fresh water, but fresher water, I should say. Um, and then at the high latitudes, you don't have that quite so much. Um, but then all of those profiles then collapse when you get down to, get down to depth here. Um, so this creates a vertical stratification here um, where you get, like I said, it's like kind of fresher water on top and the heavier salt water is down below. Um, so the, it, um, this leads to the concept of a water column stability, right? So here's our normal conditions. We have the lower density fresher water on top and a higher density salt water on the bottom. Um, but sometimes mixing can happen from something, right? This starts to get churned up. And then now we end up with some higher density salt water that's on the top and some lower density fresh water that's, on, that's underneath. You know, this is not a stable condition. The water column will work to try and fix this. And so you get vertical movement. You get the higher density water trying to sink down and then the, the fresher water Water trying to rise back up because they have different densities, you, that happens and you get what are called internal waves. Um, internal waves are these massive waves that are underneath the surface of the water. Like you will not see these. If you just, you know, go, go out to the coast and you look out, you won't see these, but radar can pick them up. So here's an example. This is um, from 1978. So it, it's an older image, but it's still valid. So this is uh, the Gulf of Mexico off the Yucatan Peninsula. And you can see they took this and then they were able to reconstruct some of this stuff. So you can see like um, there's, there's currents over here, these little blotches, those are rainstorms. And then between like the word rainstorm where it says internal waves, you can see these little kind of contours. Those, I think, are the surface waves. Those are the ones you'd be able to see. But then there's these giant waves that are under, underneath it, these internal waves, and they're humongous. All right, here's another example here in the Philippines. Um, it's, again, sort of constructed from, from radar in, or uh, infra infrared, I think this one was. Um, so again, you can't see these with your naked eye, but you can pick them up using our instruments. I mean, they can be enormous. They can be 200 meters high, and the periods can be hours. And so you could sit there, and just hours would go by, and it would just be one enormous giant wave. But there's a ton of energy in these internal waves. And so it's, as a submarine, right, you're going to have to deal with not only the surface waves, but these internal waves when you're at depth. Okay. All right, so effects of pressure on density. Now, water is mostly incompressible, which means that you can push on it, essentially, and it doesn't really compress like air will. Um, but under enough pressure, pressure, water will compress slightly, and that will increase density. Right. So here's an example. If the surface density is um, 1,028 kilograms per meters cubed, then the density at 4,000 meters increases up to 1,046 kilograms per meters cubed. Now, it's just a 2% increase, but it's enough to change buoyancy. Um, it, the, you can get into trouble here. Submarines are very delicately balanced between this stuff, so you have to be able to account for this change. Um, this is a, a nice chart here of temperature, salinity, and density all plotted together. Um, oceanographers are very good about making these kind of charts here. Um, they also, like I think just to make things clear, they often record density as, as a sort of a fraction of the density, where it's the actual density minus the 1,000 kilograms per meters cubed. It just makes it a little bit easier. So the density up top is not actually like 24 kilograms per meters cubed. It's actually 1,024 kilograms per meters cubed. Um, but you, you, you can really see the different um, clines if you're the thermocline, the halocline, and so you can see that, and you can see how things change here. 
So anyway, so they, you know, it's not just water anymore. You have to you have to include the effects of all this stuff in your calculations. Um, this is a nice little graphic about the mixed layer. So the, the the mixed layer goes back to the shallow ocean where there's fresh water being mixed up in different temperature, um, you know, profiles and and stuff like that. Um, and then there's this this region where the thermohaline the and cl um, the clines there in the middle. That's where the density and the salinity and the temperature are changing rapidly. And then there's the deep o ocean, which in terms of those three major your things are it, it's um, a little bit more calm right like it, you can use the same values and stuff but again just showing how it changes from from depth and and uh, latitude all right, so again, all of this was trying to get us to pressure, right? We've talked about hydrostatic pressure here. Here's a, a refresher, right? It's the pressure is the density times gravity times the depth. Um, but again, pressure now is going to depend on temperature, salinity, and pressure itself here. So this it's not just it's not easy. Um, this is a little example here. So you're getting down deep, right? Um, the pressures can be absolutely immense down there. I've always this struck me one time that the space station, right? All it has to withstand is one atmosphere, one, one, <laughs> uh, one atmosphere pressure. That's it, because there's just air inside, right? So this is equivalent to 10 meters down. You know, we've got, we need to get down to hundreds of meters, thousands of meters down. So the, the pressures that we need to deal with are just incredible. So we needed a specialized hull to withstand that and, and keep atmosphere pressure inside for people to live in. So it's called the pressure hull. All right. The range of the pressure hull is determined by the vertical range of the sub that you are that you are designing. So you've got a crush depth of a limit. That's your limit of operations, and it's named such that if it gets below that, it will it will be crushed by the pressure. Um, it's generally the operating depth is usually limited by the technology that we have. Um, it's usually been about like 300 meters, which is about 30 atmospheres. I know mean, we have been making some specialized subs that can go deeper. Um, fairly recently, the Deep Sea Challenger um, went down to the depth of the Mariana's Trench, and that had a depth of 11. Thousand or sorry, eleven kilometers, which is like eleven hundred atmospheres. So I mean, we so we can do that, but I mean, that was a very small thing, and not like a you know a military submarine. That's got two different scales there. Um, but in general, just I just want to touch on a pressure hull. So it's got a structure, right? The pressure acts all around it, and you want to design it such that it evenly distributes force, so like along lines of an arch or an eggshell, right? Make the force sort of work for itself, so that you can work in, in compression with steel instead of tension and stuff. Um, but even that, even with the, the benefits of a spherical shape or a cylindrical shape, you still have to heavily stiffen and reinforce these structures. So it is no easy task. Um, I mentioned the Deep Sea Challenger. Um, so it's a specialized sub to take James Cameron, the Titanic guy, um, down to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. And you can see here that the pressure hull was just this little tiny bit down there. And so this little part this, this, that is in pink, that's where the atmospheric pressure was. That's where he was. Everything else didn't have to deal, and it deal with the pressures, but it didn't have to contain it such that it had atmospheric pressure on the inside. So you could, you could do some different things there. Um, so anyway, so that's sort of the introduction to the um, environment of a submarine and the challenges that we have to meet when we make this stuff. Um, so the next lecture that we'll do will be on the actual hydrostatics of, of, um, of, the, of a submarine and, and how it behaves as it changes because it, you've got to go from the surface transitioning down when you're diving down to when you're actually at depth and then back up again. And there's some, there's some tricky stuff there. But anyways, as always, thanks for watching and see you next time.